Have you ever played Monopoly or Settlers of Catan and no one wants to trade with you? Any fights because of these games? The same thing kinda happened during the 1920s and 1930s. Protectionist policies, while not the sole reason, did contribute to the explosion of World War II. So in order to avoid any future wars, the Allies created a few institutions to help sustain a new world order. You got the UN, IMF, and World Bank, founded in 1944 and 1945. In addition to the UN, which theoretically allows peace talks on world issues, and the Bretton Wood institutions, which are supposed to deliver economic stability, countries were interested in lowering barriers of international trade. No one wanted to slap that extra wheat on the brick or that extra hundred bucks on Reading Railroad. A group of 23 countries signed the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs in October 1947, which was going to affect at least a fifth of the world's trade. There was an ambitious plan called the International Trade Organization in the negotiation, but the United States Congress shot down the idea. After the United States officially denied ratification of the ITO, GATT officially became the only multilateral organization to facilitate global trade. Initially, GATT's sole purpose was to lower tariffs between countries, but as time passed on, other pressing issues such as anti-dumping and agricultural goods became hot topics. GATT has several updates, and the Uruguay Round is when GATT evolves into the WTO that we know today. The Uruguay Round, which started from 1896 and ended in 1994, was a multilateral negotiation that took longer than expected. With evolving economies, it made sense that the organization dealt with services and intellectual property, things that GATT lacked. Lengthening negotiation also provided countries the opportunity to review the original articles. And with all these things piling up, countries decided to adopt the Uruguay Round decisions, thus establishing the WTO. By the time the WTO was established, there were 125 countries that were part of GATT. This group of countries also represented roughly 90% of global trade. When comparing GATT and WTO, it can be best claimed that the WTO equals GATT plus new roles. For example, the WTO now deals with trades and services and handles intellectual property. It's like having a pre-made team of three members in one squad called the WTO. The objective of GATT and WTO are pretty much the same. Both organizations share the commitment to lower tariffs and eliminate trade barriers and unfair trade. Through the WTO, Countries desire that both big and small countries can grow and commit to halting unfair treatment. You can imitate this attitude by liking, subscribing, and commenting on this video as a nod towards efforts of small YouTubers trying to navigate through this YouTube algorithm. The agreement system is a bit different. For GATT, agreements were multilateral and plurilateral, which means that countries can voluntarily agree to some agreements. In the WTO, all agreements are multilateral and binding. Another major difference between the two organizations is the strength of the dispute system. Both GATT and WTO have a system to intervene between countries that may disagree on certain trade problems. During the GATT years, all parties related to the trade dispute had to agree to the proposal in order to resolve a trade dispute. Yes, and by all, I'm also talking about the party that technically lost in this dispute. Without that country's consent, nothing can be solved. The WTO website claims that there weren't as many rulings that were rejected. This is probably because countries were afraid that other countries could deny rulings against them if a future trade dispute were to happen. However, this significantly weakens any negotiation related to trade disputes. Unlike GATT, the WTO created an independent body that looks into any trade disputes. If any party disagrees with the results, just like a regular jury, the appellate body will reinvestigate and then make a ruling that is binding. If countries refuse to adhere to the result, the WTO allows unilateral action against the aggressor which is usually terrorists not restricted by any rules. Because retaliation is allowed, the WTO is faster at handling disputes that are submitted by countries. Another similarity between GATT and WTO is a policy that allows countries to identify their own economic status. If a country is doing well, they can identify as developed. If a country is struggling, they can identify as developing. These labels have raised controversy among developed countries. For example, China, the second largest economy in the world, identifies themselves as a developing country. While China could probably defend this status by pointing out to their GDP per capita ranking, countries like the United States are not happy with these labels. You see, countries that have a developing country status are exempted from certain rules that bind developed countries, such as protection from other countries and certain industries. This means that developing countries can continue unfair trade in order to catch up with the wealthier countries. Because the current WTO policy allows countries to self-report and the WTO lacks the criteria on what is developing, this has been a source of debate for the past few years. All in all, both GATT and WTO wants to make sure fair trade is happening around the globe 
and that people are receiving the love they deserve. The WTO is in no way perfect and there are problems that continue to plague this organization. Keep an eye out on how big countries continue to interact with the WTO, which is the only global supranational organization that exists in all history.